What do you think the most striking part of her young personality was to you? Her confidence. Her confidence in who she was. She could bring light to any situation. She was just full of beauty. She was just like, oh, I'm unstoppable. She stood out. <laughs> Cheerful, caring, down for adventures. <laughs> She had hopes and dreams and aspirations for her life, that there was a big future ahead for her. I was getting ready to go into work. Someone texted me, called the police, Nikki's gone. In the first week, I figured she was just hanging out somewhere, lost her phone or something. We start making flyers and putting up flyers. I just knew that she was being held against her will or, or worse. One of the first clues in this case came from 17-year-old Nikki Kuhnhausen herself. When investigators discovered messages on Snapchat, a social media platform, about someone she had met that night, a man named David Bogdanov. All right. Uh, this is Detective David Jensen with Vancouver Police, and I have with me uh, David Bogdanov. Do I have your consent to record this conversation? Yep. I saw her walking. I walked up to her, asked her why is she walking alone in the middle of the night, and she said that she had some big fight with her boyfriend, and she's really upset, and uh, I was just trying to be a nice guy, yeah. you know? So, so you're the last person to ever see her. After she left with you, no one ever saw her again. I don't know what I, what I can tell you. David is kind. David is caring. David made everyone laugh. He was everyone's friend. Yeah, I try to keep my hopes high, but after six months, a little hard for that. When you heard that her remains were found, what was your initial reaction? It was devastating. Stand up for me, please. Investigators say David Bogdanov killed 17-year-old Nikki Kuhnhausen after suspected killer David Bogdanov made his first court appearance. By the time we got to trial, now we had three different versions of what happened. Mr. Bogdanov will testify to what happened that night. The whole time, I was just yelling for her to stop. He was lying, and he was full of anger. She's trying to fight me and just reaching back and scratching at my face. He had no regard for her life at all. There's a struggle going on here. Trying to gouge my eyes. There's a life or death struggle going on. His actions and his words show that he intended to kill Nikki and he intended to kill her because of who she was, a transgender young woman. This is a narrative and a story that plays out all the time. When trans people go missing, they're usually found deceased. Lisa Woods will never forget the day her life changed forever. It was June 6, 2019. That's when her daughter, Nikki Kuhnhausen, seemingly vanished. Lisa says they talked daily before work. I would call her every day and talk to her before my shift. She stopped answering. Immediately, her mother's intuition kicked in. Lisa 
had a bad feeling. That first day, I took her sweatshirt and I made it into a pillowcase, and I slept with her picture and my Bible. Did you fear that something had happened? I knew something had happened. Lisa filed a missing persons report. At first, friend Ariel Fox wasn't too concerned. Lost her phone or something. Classic Nikki move. Ariel knew all about Nikki's moves. After all, they'd been best friends since childhood. She's like the lively friend that's just always high energy. When I first met Nikki, she was still going by Nick, but she was definitely still Nikki at heart. We lived across the street from each other. I want to say third and fourth grade. Taylor Watts was a childhood friend as well. She stood out, you know? She was, like, cheerful, was caring. She was just Nikki. Becoming Nikki would be something of an evolution. But Lisa says she and her large family always knew. Very rarely did anybody call her Nicholas. Nikki began life as Nicholas. But from a young age, Lisa says Nikki had a strong sense of self. There's this one picture with a blonde wig on because the babysitter was a hairdresser and she snuck into her wigs. So she always knew who she was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She broke her arm and she had a pink cast. Her brothers were so mad that I let her get a pink cast. I'm like, she picked the color, it's her broken arm. It was around sixth grade that Nikki made her gender identity public. She decided that she was going to be Nikki all the time, not just at home. So she started dress dressing as herself. As a woman, young woman? As a young woman. Lisa says Nikki was widely accepted for who she was, especially among a certain in crowd. The cheerleaders loved the way that she did her makeup and they wanted her to do their makeup as well. And she hoped that passion would one day turn into her dream job. She wanted to be Nicki Minaj's hair and makeup artist. So that was her goal. Mm -hmm. Like most teens, Nikki loved to post online. One day she came home and told me, Mom, I'm Facebook famous. Especially tributes to her idol, that other Nikki. What's your name? My name Nick. Where you from? New York and this. How important do you think social media was to Nikki? It was pretty important. She loved doing selfies. She loved how many likes she got. Lisa says Nikki also liked fighting for the underdog. I was called to the school on many occasions because she had been suspended for hitting someone, but it was always a situation where she was defending someone else. Nikki's parents had divorced when she was young. Mother and daughter remained close as Nikki became a teen. We would go get our nails done. We would just drive around and go by the water and walk by the water. But in high school, things would begin to change. Nikki was going to school, but she would make it all the time, and she'd be hard to get a hold of sometimes. She just wouldn't wake up. She'd miss the bus. Lisa says she knew what was wrong. Nikki had started abusing drugs. She said to me, Mommy, I don't think I can do my homework without being high when she was 16. Friends say Nikki had started using methamphetamine. That's when I realized I was talking to an addict instead of my daughter. Lisa says there were many attempts to get Nikki into rehab to help her kick drugs for good, but nothing seemed to stick. For months, Nikki continued to struggle. Just how dangerous Nikki's addiction was became apparent to Lisa in 2018. I got a call at work from a detective. Lisa was told Nikki had been shot six times. Lisa raced to the hospital, expecting the worst. But when she arrived, um, <laughs> she's so excited. Two of her girlfriends were there, and she had her makeup all done. And she was sitting up laughing, and they were doing selfies. And I looked at the detective, and I'm like, I thought you said she was shot six times. It was a miracle, says Lisa. None of Nikki's injuries were life-threatening. It missed every major artery in her neck, in her thigh, twice in the stomach, in her leg, in the back of her calf. Lisa says Nikki told her she was shot during a dispute over drugs. 
What do you think it says about Nikki? She was able to survive being shot six times. She was a tough yeah. cookie. <laughs> yeah. Very tough. The man responsible for Nikki's shooting was never apprehended. Lisa hoped Nikki's brush with death would serve as the inspiration for Nikki to turn her life around. And did you think, okay, you know, we're on a different path now? I did. I mean, she knew it was a miracle. She knew. Now, a year later, Nikki was missing, and Lisa was hoping for another miracle. A missing Vancouver teenager not giving up hope that her child will be found safe. In June 2019, Lisa Woods had just one goal, finding her daughter, Nikki Kuhnhausen. All of Nikki's social media accounts had gone silent. We start making flyers. I remember there are flyers everywhere. Clark County Prosecutor Kristen Arnaud. You couldn't go to the grocery store without seeing that flyer. News of Nikki's disappearance in Vancouver, Washington, started to get more attention. She vanished more than two weeks ago, and today was listed on the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children website. Police talked to Nikki's roommates and learned the last time they'd seen her was the day she vanished. Nikki was heading out the door to meet a man she'd met just hours before. But who was he? Clark County Prosecutor Colin Hayes says her social media messages provided investigators with their first clue about who Nikki was seeing that night. We have their Snapchat messages, so we know that he picked her up. It would have been somewhere 5 a.m.-ish or so. He doesn't want to pick up the crumbs. <laughs> he was this man, 25-year-old David Bogdanov, who worked at his family-owned construction business. Their exchanges gave police their first glimpse of a timeline when he and Nikki met. That was the last time she was seen alive by anyone else. So detectives were looking to talk to him within a couple weeks of Nikki going missing. The investigators tried his home. They left cards. I think they also tried calling him, weren't able to get a hold of him. They also sent Snapchat messages. But Bogdana did not reply. It seemed he had vanished, just like Nikki. Weeks grew into months without any leads. I just knew that she was being held against her will or worse. In late September, nearly four months after Nikki went missing, investigators finally heard from David Bogdanov. He said he had had phone problems and had just gotten their messages. Detectives asked him to come in for questioning, hoping he could help the investigation. Until you talk to him and get the story, you don't necessarily know if there might be, maybe there was someone else after that may have seen her. So on October 2nd, Bogdana voluntarily met with Detective David Jensen of the Vancouver Police Department. David, were you aware that this is recording? Yep. In their recorded interview, Bogdana told Jensen he was out drinking with his brothers on June 6th when he noticed a young woman. It was on this Vancouver block around 3 a.m. that David Bogdana claims he first spotted Nikki alone. He says he walked over to her to check to see if she was okay. They started talking. I offered her my jacket because it was really cold outside. Bogdanov also offered Nikki a drink. I said, do you want some vodka? Because I got some if you want to have a drink just to relax a little bit. And she said, sure. So I just gave her that bottle okay. to take with her. He also gave Nikki his contact information. I did give her my Snapchat name. I wanted to just exchange Snapchats and she didn't have a phone with her. Bogdanov says he and Nikki then parted ways. A few hours later, Nikki sent him the address where she was staying with friends. Bogdanov drove over and picked her up. He said he was going to help her find her phone because her phone was missing. Later that morning, Bogdanov says he and Nikki found themselves alone in his car. Kind of just parked there in the driveway, chit-chatting a little bit, and then she told me that she's not a she. Bogdanov says that's when Nikki revealed she was transgender. I was shocked to find that out and just uncomfortable and really, really disturbed. 
and I asked her to please get out of the car because this is just really weird for me. She just got out of the car and I took off. He's pretty vague about the details at that point and just says that was the last I saw of her. While he was uncertain about some details of that night, Arnaud says Bogdanov was clear on one topic. He went out of his way to make sure that they knew that he found that anyone who was part of the LGBTQI community, that he found them disgusting. LGBTQI is an abbreviation to refer to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex people and communities. For me, it's even disturbing when I'm around a gay person or somebody bi or transsexual or something, you know, so mm -hmm. I just got disgusted and I asked her to just get out. Bogdanov offered up another piece of information, though he was never asked. I wish I could help you more, but I don't know. I'm not a kind of person to, I'm not even a violent person, you know, at all, nothing. Bogdanov's interview ended and he left the police station. Then on December 7th, 2019, six months after Nikki vanished, a man walking a nearby Larch Mountain found something that would change this case forever. Nobody goes about their day expecting that they're gonna find a body. Christmas card that morning because I had hoped that she was coming home. It was nearly Christmas 2019, and Lisa Woods was aching for one miraculous gift, the safe return of her 17-year-old daughter, Nikki Kuhnhausen. She'd been missing for six unbearable months. And I prayed and I prayed to bring my baby home, just bring my baby home to me. But the unsettling discovery of a human skull on December 7, 2019, brought a swarm of local authorities to thickly wooded Larch Mountain, including Detective Joe Swenson from the Clark County Sheriff's Office. This was the trail that we actually entered into the area, and there were items found immediately inside the tree line. Underneath the dense canopy of trees, the remnants of a human life had been scattered by animals down a steep ravine. There were a bunch of clothing items found down there, specifically like a green jacket, some underwear. There was a bandana. There were more bones, jewelry. You also found a phone cord. Correct. What's there the was... significance of that? When we found the, the phone charging cord, it was tied in a knot, but it was in a circle about four inches in diameter. Tangled inside the knotted cord, were artificial, multicolored hair extensions. So looking at the cord in conjunction with the hair, it seemed pretty obvious that if it were placed around somebody's neck, that's how the, the hair would have gotten caught up in it. After combing the rugged terrain for two days, detectives suspected someone had been murdered. You know, we had a couple of missing persons cases that were kind of on our mind. We started talking with more detectives and other agencies and learning, hey, this could be Nikki Kuhnhausen, and oh, come to find out, she's been missing for six months. That's when the Vancouver police began another exhaustive search, says Swenson, comparing evidence photos taken on the mountain to Nikki's personal photos found online, looking for matches. And actually found a lot of images of her wearing the exact items that we had found up here. And so it was a good confirmation initially to be able to say, yeah, we're pretty sure this is Nikki. About a week later, dental records verified the victim's identity. It was Nikki Kuhnhausen, and it was murder. The medical examiner determined that Nikki had been strangled to death with that cell phone charger cord. Sorry for interrupting your commute this morning. Um, December 17th, 2019, Vancouver police detective David Jensen once again questioned the last known person to see Nikki alive, David Bogdanov. It sounded like you said that you were going to go to your job site. Yeah, I went to work. Yeah, he went to work. Bogdanov stuck to his story. On the morning of June 6th, after Nikki divulged she was transgender, 
He said he was shocked and disturbed. And that's when you're like, I'm not, I'm not into this and kicked her out of the van, sent her on her way. Bogdanov said he then drove straight to work in nearby Portland, Oregon. So at the time that we talked, I didn't have uh, the benefit of all of your, your phone records. Okay, but, but now there's been some initial analysis done. So you left, your phone left and then went east out past Larch Mountain. What happened on that trip? His cell phone record suggested he had never driven to work that morning, but actually traveled in the opposite direction to Larch Mountain. That trip took about an hour round trip, up some logging roads, and then back again. I think I want to talk with the Lord. Okay, all right. So you're being arrested today for the murder of Nikki Tukasin, whose remains have been discovered, who was strangled to death. Okay. Stand up for me, please. A few hours later, Detective David Jensen told Lisa they had found Nikki. And I fell to my knees and started screaming, and he came in and held me until I could gain my composure. After I calmed down, Dave told me, I want you to know that I arrested David this morning. I wanted to make sure he was charged and behind bars before I came and told you. Charges were murder in the second degree and malicious harassment, which is now called hate crime in Washington. What were your first reactions when you heard he had been arrested? I mean, truthfully, I was pretty surprised. Clinical social worker Devin Davis Williamson and Lyndon Walls are transgender activists. They launched the Justice for Nikki Task Force. Most of the time in our culture, in our country, if a trans person is killed, there is not an arrest made. We think it's right around 30% of trans people who are murdered have someone arrested and fully prosecuted. Having someone held accountable, I think only that can start the healing and also bring attention to some of the things that the trans community is burdened with. Part of their burden, says Lyndon, is living with fear. Fear of being misunderstood. Fear of being attacked. A recent UCLA Law School study concluded that transgender people are four times more likely than non-transgender people to become victims of violent crime. An explosion of hate, the American Medical Association has called an epidemic of violence. Trans lives matter! Trans lives matter! A transgender woman was found shot and killed over the weekend. We need this to stop. Trans lives matter! Trans lives matter! Trans lives matter! There was a vigil for her. It was um, really overwhelming to see how much love that the trans community had come together for my daughter. And that's where I met Devin. She helped me find focus and purpose. She told me that she was going to make sure that nobody forgot Nikki's name and that it was going to make a difference. With help from her new friends, Lisa's focus slowly shifted from the horror of facing her daughter's violent death to the hope of finding justice for her murder. Lisa was so driven to see justice and to do right for her child. And I think that's given Lisa purpose and drive to stay alive. She was a rainbow of light. She was so confident in who she was at a press conference just days after Bogdanov's arrest, Lisa Woods became an activist. I believe this man, I believe he killed her because she was a transgender. I believe that with all my heart. 
By August 2021, David Bogdanov's day of reckoning was fast approaching. His murder trial was just two weeks away when prosecutors learned he had changed his story dramatically. You solemnly swear or affirm the And he would take the stand to tell it himself. Jeez, jumping from my gun. And all I can think is, oh my God, I'm going to get shot right now. Always there for everyone, no matter what. Vicki Matsuk, David Bogdanov's niece, does not believe her uncle is capable of the murder he's accused of committing. He would always get along with everyone. Just days before the trial, he reassured his sister Lily. I just remember him telling us not to worry. He was ready to just face whatever is coming. And Lisa was also ready. I just prayed. I prayed for God to have his hands in it. The red light is the microphone. That'll the court supplied a Zoom feed as the trial got underway in August 2021. Each day, family and friends rallied around Lisa wearing pink masks to court. Please have a seat. I think sitting in a room with the man that murdered your kid is hard, impossibly hard. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please give your attention. Opening your statements family. began with a bold claim from the defense. Um, our client did not strangle Nikki Kuhnhausen, causing her death because she's transgendered. Nikki Kuhnhausen is now deceased because Mr. Bogdanov had to defend himself against her attacking him and possibly killing him. But the prosecution argued that was not the case. The defendant murdered Nikki after finding out she was transgender. They insisted Nikki was the victim of a hate crime. The defendant murdered Nikki because his respect for human life was outweighed by his hatred for those who are gay and those who are transgender. The prosecution laid out its case with experts testifying about those Snapchat exchanges leading up to the murder and cell phone records placing Bogdanov's phone at Larch Mountain just hours later. Jurors were shown evidence found at the scene, including that phone charging cord. The defense called just one witness. The defense calls David Bogdanov. Bogdanov himself. Attorney Aaron McAleer questioned Bogdanov about his religious upbringing and his views about LGBTQI people. Yeah, I was, I was taught that uh, it is a sin and it's not okay. It's not David's lifestyle, but if David comes across anybody, whoever it is, there's no hate. Bogdanov told the jury what happened when he and Nikki were alone in his car. And what was Nikki doing at that point? She was smoking something out of a pipe. Bogdanov said Nikki asked him to join her in the back seat. Before he did, he said he wedged the gun he carried between the driver's seat and center console. So that transitioned into us making out. Is there touching or anything else? Yes. Okay. Who was touching who? It was a little bit of both at first. Um, where was she touching you? Her. She started touching me um, in my private area. Bogdanov said the sexual encounter escalated quickly. And that's when he realized Nikki was transgender. Bogdanov's testimony may be disturbing to some viewers. I was in shock. I just been deceived. I freak out and I uh, push her, push her back, and just start freaking out, saying, "You didn't tell me you're a dude," and started yelling at her to uh, says she, she's a disgusting, disgusting piece of piece of crap. 
He said he told Nikki to get out of his car. And he said she reacted with violence. She kind of picked up her foot and tried to just kick me with her foot from the passenger side. And she just jumps up and goes towards the center console towards my gun. I'm thinking, you know, I just was deceived by this person. And this person's high on meth. And all I can think is, oh my God, I'm going to get shot right now. The suggestion that Nikki might have gone for the gun kind of defies logic. Bogdanov said he tried to restrain Nikki by grabbing her jacket, but the material was too slippery to get a good grip. He claims in a desperate attempt to save himself, he reached for a cell phone charging cord. I grabbed that cable and put it around her and pull her back like that and hold her, hold her from, from going, keep going forward with the gun. Bogdanov said he placed the phone cord around Nikki's arms and chest during their struggle. But as he pulled, the cord slipped up to her neck. The whole time she's trying to fight me and just reaching back and scratching at my face, trying to gouge my eyes. So at some point does she stop struggling? Yes. The ligature that was used to kill Nikki was a phone cord that was tied to a space of 3.97 inches, which ends up being about like this. And if you can imagine the physical sensation of having your throat constricted to a space this size and then have it triple knotted. After realizing Nikki was dead, Bogdanov said he panicked. First thing I think is I need to call the police and and then I think that they're not going to believe me. You know, I've been up all night, not sober. Um, there's drugs in the car. There's a dead person in the back seat. At that point, I thought I need to get rid of the body. This was a very humiliating thing that happened to me. I just wanted to put this behind me, like wishing it, was, it never happened. Bogdanov said that's when he drove Nikki's body to Larch Mountain. I pulled her out of the car and it was that spot by the road. The, the hill just went down really steep. I just kind of pushed her, pushed her down that. Then... Can you tell the jury why, why you left the country? Bogdanov told the court he left the country just hours after killing Nikki, buying a last-minute ticket to Ukraine. I was scared, an emotional wreck. I was thinking I need to, I need to quit my drinking, and that I likely would have not have been in this situation if I hadn't been drinking, and just wanted to get away. The fact that he had multiple different stories, that he had had at least two opportunities to give this explanation to detectives and hadn't. The fact that he dumped the body. The fact that he ran from the country, all things kind of point to a guilty conscience and not someone who thinks that their actions are justified. Good afternoon. Both sides made their case one last time during closing arguments. His motivations the entire time have been about his hate, his rage, and his shame for, for finding out that Nikki was transgender. It's not about fear. This case is not about self-defense. I want to start by saying... Defense attorney Matthew Hoff strongly disagreed. Nikki, Nikki Kuhnhausen is not here today, not because she was transgender, but because Mr. Bogdanov was put in a life and death situation. Learn more about the life and death of Nikki Kuhnhausen at 48hours.com. She just loved the camera, you know? Seemed like the camera liked her back. Mm hmm Nikki was just Nikki. She kind of led the way. I just followed. She was very empowered and very steadfast in her identity, and I think very strong, probably in a way that society struggles to handle. 
after two weeks of an emotional trial. And more than two years after Nikki Kuhnhausen's death, would jurors believe David Bogdanov's claim of self-defense? David is not the person that they made him out to be. David is kind. David is caring. Or the prosecution's case that he murdered Nikki after he learned she was transgender. She was so strong in her identity, and that's ultimately why she was killed. The jury deliberated for more than two days. We weren't sure how it was going to go. There was possibility of a hung jury. Finally, on day three, they informed the judge they had reached a unanimous decision. We, the jury, find the above named defendant guilty of the crime of murder in the second degree as charged in count one. Verdict form count two, we, the jury, find the above named defendant guilty of the crime of malicious harassment. A hate crime in Washington. It's a win. It's a really big win. I'm just happy to get justice for you know, Nikki's family. Two weeks later, Lisa would ask the judge to impose the maximum sentence. We'll see her smile, watch her graduate, see her married or watch her parents. I wanted to show how Nikki could have been and so many things that were stolen from us, so many milestones that she'll never get to do. And I miss her every day. Before handing down the sentence, Judge David Gregerson addressed the court, saying he was, quote, struck by the darker nature of this crime. It conjures up old childhood legends of the boogeyman, of trust gone terribly wrong. <clears throat> Fighting back tears, the judge continued for almost 15 minutes. And the movement towards something resembling justice may be seen as a step in the greater overall movement from darkness toward light. In this court's view, that can and should be Nikki Kuhnhausen's legacy. Bogdanov was sentenced to the maximum 19 and a half years for Nikki's murder, with 12 concurrent months for the malicious harassment charge. I think it was appropriate in this case. It doesn't necessarily seem like a long amount of time when you think about what he took from Nikki and Nikki's family. After sentencing, family, friends, and supporters gathered outside the courtroom. She was just a baby. She was just a, a teenager. He took her life, and, you know, he, he got the maximum, and that's what he deserved. Nikki's story has allowed us to take a giant leap forward. Lisa and Nikki's supporters have tried to find a way for her legacy to help and protect others. Finding a way to memorialize Nikki and empower other trans teenagers to pursue their dreams, um, I think is, is the next step. I want to thank Nikki's family. And that happened with the passing of legislation in Washington state known as Nikki's Law. I am happy to sign this bill. It's designed to prevent defendants charged with violent crimes from relying on a victim's gender identity or sexual orientation, the so-called gay or trans panic defense. Nikki's law makes it impossible to use what's called the trans panic defense in court, where someone says that they were so out of control when they found out that someone was trans that you essentially aren't culpable for your actions. Washington is one of 16 states to pass similar legislation. Nikki's supporters hope her law will inspire even more states to follow suit. What's it like to know that your daughter's legacy, there's a law named after her? I'm glad it will help other people. I want her death to mean something to someone who may contemplate hurting an another transgender person. Devin and Lyndon are proud of what they achieved with the Justice for Nikki Task Force and hope Nikki's story will help the transgender community. My hope is that this work has, has created a domino effect and this will hopefully lead to other trans kids and teens having a different life outcome. As Lisa moves forward without Nikki, she carries a special reminder of her daughter, a necklace she wears every day.
Um, I just got this for my birthday from my son Alex, and he made it to put Nikki's ashes in. You always have Nikki close to your heart? Yes. How do you want Nikki remembered? For her loyalty to what she believed in, staying true to who she was. Just staying true to her, her family and friends no matter what. Unconditional love for everyone. The Chadwicks, they lived well. A wealthy California couple. Peter and her were missing. There's a little bit of blood splattered around. The manhunt, the capture. Saturday.